Um, hello, everybody. Um, we're back with the second or third part of this course. Um, we have the good fortune to have uh, Dave Wagner, who is a valued friend and colleague from Northern Arizona University. Uh, Dave's going to give us kind of a broad overview of disease ecology. So essentially starting to set the stage for diseases as, um, as sets of interacting species and interactions amongst um, elements of biodiversity. So I'm going to turn this over to Dave and it'll be very interesting to see what he has to say. Okay, hello everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you today. So just to give you a little background, I'm coming to you uh, from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is about 100 kilometers south of the Grand Canyon. So that should give you a uh, geographical... Dave, turn off your Google Plus page. Something is repeating back to you. friend and colleague from Northern Arizona University. Uh, Dave's going to give us kind of a broad overview of disease ecology. So essentially starting to set the stage for diseases as, um, as sets of interacting species and interactions amongst um, elements of biodiversity. Dave, and it would be Dave? interesting to see what yeah. you say. You, you, you must have a window open other than the hangout window. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here find it? with all of you today. So just to give you the background, I'm coming to you. You've got the event Flagstaff, page open Arizona, somewhere. Which is about 100 kilometers south of the Grand Canyon. I don't have it open, Tom. Geographical. Dave, turn off your Google Plus page. Something is repeating back to you. Sorry, that was me. You there, Dave? I'm still here. Okay, we're we're back and we're ready to go now. Start into your talk, please, and excuse me. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to uh, my, my slides now. Not my email. Bear with me here. Okay, so. I'm going to give a basic introduction to disease ecology this morning using several different examples. And the one example that I will draw heavily on is plague, because plague is a disease I'm very familiar with. Uh, we have it every year here in northern Arizona and go out and sample it from the field. And I've got international collaborations around the world on plague. And so I'm very familiar with it, and I think it's a great example of disease ecology. But also, before I start into that, I will uh, give a few other examples and, and just sort of explain what disease ecology is, uh, why we want to study it, and how understanding disease ecology is essential for efforts to map disease transmission risk. Uh, so understanding disease ecology is important because it influences persistence or survival of infectious diseases, uh, their spread or dispersal, and even the virulence of an infectious disease is affected by its ecology. So it seems like uh, we often have old diseases reemerging on a regular basis. Of course, the one that's on everyone's mind right now, rightfully so, is Ebola, which has reemerged once again from wildlife uh, reservoirs and is causing more human deaths than it ever has before. But there are, are numerous other infectious diseases that, that seem to never go away. And here is a, a recent report about uh, the cholera epidemic in Haiti. So cholera is an ancient scourge of the human species that keeps emerging time and time again. And so why does this happen? Why do we get reemergence of these different infectious diseases? Well, to understand that, we, we need to look at the ecology of these diseases to understand why. So we're all familiar with the example of smallpox. 
it's one of the greatest public health successes of all time. Uh, the the campaign to eradicate smallpox, and so here we have the public, uh, the World Health Organization report about smallpox and its eradication, and then the book written by D. A. Henderson, a physician who headed up the eradication of smallpox, and again a huge success story, but uh, really. Uh, a rare event. So besides smallpox, the only other infectious disease that we can say has been eradicated is rinderpest. And so why is it that we could eradicate smallpox and we can't do it for other infectious diseases? Why is it so difficult to eradicate other infectious diseases? Well, the answer comes down to ecology. So smallpox had a very simple ecology. It only infected humans, and so it spread between humans, from human to human to human, without any animal or other environmental type of reservoir. And so despite the fact that that caused huge impacts on the human population, uh, it had a very simple ecology and so intervention strategies could focus only on humans without having to worry about any other species uh, and that and, and the fact that a vaccination was readily available those two things led to the eventual eradication of smallpox. However, um, the reason we can't do this with more infectious diseases is because most of them have a much more complex ecology so why is, what is disease ecology and why is it important? Well, disease ecology is important because of the, the known infectious agents that infect humans, more than 60% of them are zoonotic. That is, they can be transmitted between humans and animals. And so unlike smallpox, uh, we, we may be able to eradicate some of these diseases in humans for a short period of time, but if they're still maintained in animals, which many of them are, then we also have to be concerned about those animal reservoirs, which can serve uh, uh, as reservoirs for future uh, reemergence of these diseases in the humans. So what do we mean by disease ecology? Well, let's start with just what is ecology? We all know this, but let's just revisit. So ecology, of course, is understanding relationships between groups of living things and their environments. And so disease ecology then is simply just understanding relationships between pathogens, hosts, and their environments. And so some of the things that the field of disease ecology is concerned about um, would be disease emergence, disease reemergence, persistence or survival, and spread or dispersal, among many other things. And by necessity, disease ecology is an interdisciplinary uh, field of study. So it involves all types of people, from ecologists to microbiologists to health care workers to informaticists uh, all work together to understand disease ecology and it's certainly an emerging uh, rising field in science. And so as I mentioned earlier understanding disease ecology is very important because it can aid our efforts to control, prevent, and or predict the emergence or reemergence of diseases. Okay, so let me give you a few examples here. Let's start with something that's very simple. The simple disease ecology of anthrax, which is caused by the bacterium Bacillus anthracis. And so anthrax is a disease of large animals. Um, in most places around the world it affects cows, but many other uh, large mammal species are affected by anthrax. And its simple life cycle is illustrated here. So anthrax can form spores which can persist in the environment for years, maybe decades, maybe, maybe even longer. No one really knows. 
And so those spores can just hang out in the environment. And every so often, uh, an animal such as a cow will come along, and in the course of grazing, it will inhale some of these spores, which once they get inside the animal, convert from being spores to being vegetative cells. And so once they become vegetative cells, uh, they start multiplying and they start forming toxins that eventually will kill the host species. That's all part of the plan of anthrax or bacillus anthracis. Uh, once the animal dies uh, and the, the carcass is either ripped open or um, just breaks open naturally from decomposing and those vegetative cells are exposed to oxygen, they convert back to spores which then can live in the soil for a very long period of time. So the ecology for anthrax is really quite, quite simple compared to most diseases. Now how do humans become infected? Well, humans can inhale spores, which in, an, in, in a natural setting is extremely rare, but it does happen. But of course that's the, the the route by which anthrax has been weaponized because it can be spread by these aerosolized spores. Humans most often get cutaneous anthrax, so if they have a cut on their hands and they're handling, uh, for example, an animal skin from an animal that was infected with anthrax, some of those spores can get into those cuts and cause cutaneous anthrax. And of course, in, in many places of the world, uh, a down animal is going to be eaten no matter what. And so if that animal was infected with anthrax, uh, then a human could get it by eating infected meat and get gastrointestinal anthrax. Okay, so by understanding uh, the simple ecology of anthrax then, uh, that gives us opportunities for control and prevention. And so in the case of anthrax, one way that we control and prevent it is using vaccines for cattle. So we vaccinate cattle against uh, we vaccinate cattle against uh, anthrax. And so what that serves to do is we uh, don't have outbreaks in cattle, which then lead to um, these masses of spores in the environment. Okay, and something else we can do to control and prevent anthrax in humans is proper treatment of killed animals. So if an animal does die of anthrax, uh, we can dispose of that body properly. And usually what that means is burying, uh, burning the body and then burying the remains in a deep hole. So in this case, the ecology is very simple. But ecology can oftentimes be much more complex. Oh, here, so let me talk about spores and, and how that facilitates the spread by humans because we were talking about the fact, we were talking about the fact that, you have to forgive me here, I need to, okay, so I was talking about the fact that spores um, form in skin of these dead animals. And so, Interestingly, that has probably led to the spread of anthrax around the world. So animals that are infected with anthrax don't move very far. We like to say dead cows don't walk very far. And so how has anthrax spread successfully out of Africa where it likely originated to occur around the world? Well, we think humans were involved in that, um, both in ancient times and in more recent times. So here are a couple of old papers uh, from uh, earlier in the last century. And you'll, you'll see this, this article on the left, anthrax in animal horsehair. So there were actually infections uh, during the First World War of soldiers because they were using horsehair brushes for shaving, to put on their shaving cream. And those horses had been infected with anthrax, and so there were anthrax spores uh, in the hair. And in the United States, there are many cases of, or there used to be many cases when we had a textile industry, of people working in textile mills becoming infected uh, with anthrax by inhaling the anthrax spores that would come off of wool 
and other animal products that they were handling. And so prior to this, uh, in prehistoric times, we think that humans were also moving anthrax around but via animal skins, and that probably accounts for movement, again, out of Africa to all the other continents and besides Antarctica. And so the ecology has the fact that it can form these spores in, in the environment has facilitated the spread of anthrax by humans. Let's talk about a disease that has a much more complex ecology. Uh, Lyme disease, which is caused by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay, so Lyme disease is a big problem in the eastern part of the United States. And the ecology is really quite complex, and it involves ticks of all life stages. And so larval ticks uh, can acquire, acquire their infections by feeding on a variety of different infected animals, birds, mice, squirrels, many different things. Uh, and then those ticks become, uh, stay infected throughout their lifestyle. Uh, and that involves feeding on other host species and passing on the infection back to the reservoir species and eventually getting to tick uh, life stages that can feed on humans and other hosts. Okay, and so this ecology becomes very, very uh, complex if you consider all the different reservoir species involved here and then you've got this vector uh, population that's involved that is uh, very widespread. So because of that, control of Lyme disease would be very difficult given this complex ecology because you would have to try and control a, a tick vector, which is very difficult, and then all these other wild animal populations. And again, controlling those uh, would be difficult and, and possibly even unethical. These are native rodents, so we can't just go out there and just exterminate them for the purposes of trying to eradicate this disease. So instead, uh, control uh, efforts to reduce human disease then are focused on prevention of this, um, of just becoming exposed to this disease. And so throughout the eastern United States, you'll see different um, signs like this one about how to prevent Lyme disease and they're focused on preventing tick bites and then if you do get a tick bite removing it uh, quickly because if you remove it quickly enough um, you will not become infected by the Lyme bacterium. Okay so the ecology in, in, in this case is informing uh, how we go about controlling or preventing this disease. Okay let me shift now and spend the rest of the time talking about plague as an example of the importance of disease ecology. Okay, the basic ecology of plague is this really. It can be any rodent. Plague infects hundreds of different, of rodent, different species of rodents around the world and many, many different types of fleas that are associated with those rodents. But plague is a disease of rodents and their fleas and it's constantly cycling back and forth. A flea takes a meal off an infected rodent and then goes and feeds on another rodent, passes along the infection, that rodent infects more fleas and it continues uh, forever really. And so this is the basic ecology of plague. Humans then are infected either by direct contact with rodent host species or much more commonly uh, by the bite of an infected flea resulting in bubonic plague which is the most common form. Now this ecology, the fact that uh, a rodent must infect a flea explains why plague is so deadly. If you consider how tiny a blood meal is that a flea takes. It's very, very small. And so in order for uh, a flea to be able to pick up the causative agent, the bacterium Yersinia pestis, that means that the rodent host must have a very high bacteremia. So there has to be a very high density of Yersinia pestis in the rodent blood to 
infect a flea that's feeding upon it and therefore continue the life cycle. So for that reason, Yersinia pestis has evolved to be highly vir virulent and cause a very high bacteremia, killing its host species. And it's for this reason, its ecology, that it's evolved to be so highly virulent. So the fact that it, it needs to be virulent in the host to infect the flea uh, has repercussions for human health because the same factors that cause it to be so deadly in a rodent also cause it to be so deadly uh, in humans as well. And so the, the virulence is uh, tied into the ecology. Okay, of course, e ecology can be much more difficult. Uh, I apologize for the quality of this figure. It did not convert very well over to the PDFs. But here's that cycle that I just showed you, what we would call the enzootic or maintenance cycle of Yersinia pestis or plague in the environment. And as I mentioned, this involves many different species, but it's still very poorly understood, despite having studied it for over 100 years. It's just that the rodents are so cryptic, um, and plague seems to be bouncing back and forth from ro one rodent species to another, that it's difficult to study uh, in any one location. So we have this enzootic cycle. Sometimes we have an amplification cycle or epizootic cycle, and this is what we study a lot in um, northern Arizona where I live. And this epizootic cycle is really our window into plague because uh, this occurs in much more conspicuous animals. These are animals that are active during the day and live in dense colonies. Uh, and so when they start to die of plague, we can notice and go out and collect samples in the form of plague-infected fleas. But the complex ecology comes in when we have it spreading from one species of rodents and their fleas to another species of rodents and their fleas and back and forth. And of course, uh, when we consider disease transmission and the risk of disease transmission to humans, we also have to consider many other things, such as incidental hosts, like carnivores, um, things like lag lagomores, hares and rabbits, and even pet cats. It turns out that in the United States, house cats are an important source of plague infections to humans because they uh, quickly progress in the disease to pneumonic plague and then can transfer pneumonic plague directly to humans if they're living with them in their homes. And then, uh, of course, during the great pandemics, we think there was person-to-person -person transmission of plague, which still occurs uh, in some places of the world, such as uh, Madagascar, for example, but in actuality is extremely rare. Okay, so that's plague ecology. It becomes very complex. We know some of the basic things. We know that it cycles between rodents and fleas but we don't always know some of the details, such as the specific rodent species that are involved in a, in a given location. Okay, so ecology is important to the dispersal of infectious disease, the dispersal or spread. And in this example that we're using, the example of plague in Yersinia pestis, the ability of Yersinia pestis to infect rodents associated with humans such as rats, has facilitated the global spread of plague with deadly consequences for humans. And of course what we're talking about here are the three historical plague pandemics. So there have been three major plague pandemics. Uh, the first one occurred from the 6th to the 8th century AD and was known as Justinian plague. And we recently published a paper where we showed that uh, the Justinian plague likely arose in China and then spread from China to affect North Africa, Europe, and many different parts of Asia. And, and we think that spread during the first pandemic occurred on ancient trade routes such as the Silk Road or the Silk Route. So even back then we think that humans were moving rats around in their supplies and that facilitated the spread of Europe uh, excuse me, the spread of plague to Europe and Africa out of the place where it evolved in Central Asia. So during this first pandemic, tens of millions of people died, maybe more than that, and population losses were estimated at 50 to 60 percent because plague had never before been present in Europe 
likely before this first pandemic. It then disappeared for quite a long time, not from Central Asia where it's always been, but from uh, North Africa and Europe and the places where we most think of the human plague pandemics. It disappeared for about 600 years and then came back, re-emerged with a vengeance uh, in the 14th century. So the second pandemic actually extended from the 14th through the 17th centuries. So that's a very long time. And again, affected, came out of Central Asia, affected North Africa, Europe, parts of Asia. Now what everybody knows about, of course, is the Black Death. But the Black Death was, was just a five-year period within, within the second pandemic. Uh, but during that five-year period, it's estimated that almost 30 million people died, or about 30 to 40 percent of the European population at the time. And so huge impacts. Again, we think uh, plague travel along trade routes again from Europe, or excuse me, from Central Asia to Europe to cause a second pandemic. Because if we look at the genomic and genetic record, we see that the 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 lineage of plague associated with the first pandemic is distinct from the lineage associated with the second pandemic, which suggests that plague arose out of its rodent reservoirs in Asia on multiple occasions, spread along trade routes by humans to cause the first and second pandemics. Now the more, most recent pandemic uh, is the third pandemic, and this occurred from the 19th through the 20th centuries and again, there were tens of millions of deaths worldwide. Now at this time, um, in the first and second pandemic, the spread was along uh, trade routes along land. But now, the difference with the third pandemic is uh, human technology. So by this time, around 1850 into 1900 is when it really started to spread globally. Humans had uh, more advanced technology. We had steamships that could cross the oceans much more rapidly than uh, in the past when uh, ships were powered by wind. And so there was rapid global spread of plague then out of China to Africa, North and South America, Australia, and Europe. But this time, for the first time during the third pandemic, there was groundbreaking research conducted that, that determined that Yersinia pestis, that plague was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. It was carried by rats and other rodents, and it was vectored by fleas. And so that uh, led to, that knowledge of the ecology of the disease then led to uh, ideas for control. And the two main things that keep plague in check these days are improved hygiene, so uh, controlling rat populations in cities and other places was uh, a huge uh, positive step in controlling uh, plague in cities and other places, simply just controlling the rat populations, which controlled the vector, the flea vector populations. And of course, the advent of antibiotics. Plague is very easily treated by antibiotics. So the reason we don't have huge plague pandemics today is that we've done a better job of rat control and we have antibiotics to treat it. Okay, so here is, Town talked about the importance of GenBank and, and other genetic sources um, for the efforts that you guys are doing in informatics. And our group certainly uses genomics and whole genome sequencing on a regular basis. So here's a, here's a phylogeny that we constructed using uh, differences discovered from whole genome sequencing. And so over here on the right side of your screen is the root. So we know that Yersinia pestis evolved from a soil bacterium or an enteric pathogen known as Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and it acquired several different virulence plasmids and became Yersinia pestis, the cause of plague. So if we look at the more ancient or basal populations down by the root, you'll see all this yellow and blue. Now down here, yellow corresponds to China, and blue corresponds to the former Soviet Union. So we're talking about 
uh, Central Asia here. So plague evolved in Central Asia, and most of the diversity, the genetic diversity of plague is found still in Central Asia in the ancestral foci that, that are maintained by various rodent species there. Now, if you look out at the tips of the branches, then you'll see populations that have spread to places like the Middle East, Central Africa, and then you have this population over here on the left hand of your screen where you see all these different colors. And these different colors correspond to various locations around the world. And so it is this group over here, what we call the one ori group or the one orientalis group. This is the group that spread around the world during the third pandemic. Remember, due to its ecology, the fact that plague could infect rats uh, that are closely associated with humans meant that those rats could climb onto, well, there are always rats on ocean-going ships, but if those rats came into contact with plague-infected rats in their port of call, then uh, there could be plague-infested rats and fleas on these ships that were crossing the oceans. Once they got to their new port on the other side of the ocean, then um, plague could could spread from the ship to rat populations in those cities where they landed. And that's how plague was spread uh, around the world, by ships carrying plague-infested infest rats. So that's what happened with all these populations associated with uh, the third pandemic over here. So here's a map showing the here's a map showing the spread of plague during the third pandemic. Okay, up here at the top, I have the portion of the tree associated with the third pandemic. Again, all those colors. And what you can see in this inset here is it started in um, spreading out of Hong Kong. So the third pandemic started in the Yunnan province of China. And once it reached Hong Kong and got on ocean-going ships, then it spread to other places in Asia. As you can see here, Africa, South America, North America, and it even spread, even though it's not shown on this map, it even spread down to Australia, so pretty much all the occupied locations in the world. And again, that was due to these steamships, so plague ecology, its association with rats meant that it could be spread the, over these huge distances um, due to humans and their ships. Okay, so as a result of this spread, this now is the current distribution of plague around the world. Okay, remember, the ancient foci are here in Central Asia. Russia should be read too, it just didn't show up in this paper. But Central Asia, this is where plague evolved, and these, this is where the ancient foci are. But because of the spread during the, United, uh, during the third pandemic then, we now have new loci in Africa, other parts of Asia that used to be plague-free, South America, and North America. And you'll note that the current distribution does not include Europe. Why not? We know that plague was a huge, hugely important infectious disease in Europe. That's where we have the reports of all the pandemics and millions of people dying. Well, I would surmise that, that the ecological situation that was going on in the first and second pandemics when plague was ravaging Europe was quite different then than it is now. Uh, rat populations were huge at those times. Um, flea populations as well. Humans had fleas back then, maybe not carrying around on their bodies, but certainly in their bedding. And so that ecology, that sort of artificial ecology involving the non-native rats and their fleas, uh, led to uh, uh, an ecology that was sustainable for plague in Europe for centuries, but no longer exists there today because of hygiene efforts that have cleaned up the cities and drastically reduced the rat populations. So in that case, they were able to change the ecology in Europe so it was no longer favorable for plague in that area. And you'll notice that even though it was spread to Australia, it did not persist there. And I'll get to that in a moment. 
Okay, so let's talk about ecology and persistence. So understanding disease ecology also helps us to understand the persistence of infectious diseases. And so in the case of our model here, our example, plague, it's due to the close associations, uh, association between plague and rodents that plague may not persist and become ecologically established in areas without diverse rodent communities. That's probably what happened in Europe, that the rodent community, the native rodent community, simply isn't diverse enough to support uh, plague in the environment. So once the non-native rodents were controlled, then the ecology, ecological situation was no longer favorable for it in Europe. And indeed, this is the same thing that happened in Australia. So if you look at this article here on the left, both of these are from 1900, which is when plague was spreading all around the world on those steamships. You'll see this article in public health reports about plague in Sydney. And if any of you have ever been to Sydney, this is the location right below uh, the Harbour Bridge by the Opera House, known as the Rocks. Plague got in there and was introduced to the native, non-native rat populations and started causing human disease. It also got into other cities, as you can see over here on the right, such as Adelaide. But um, as this paper shows you, it didn't last very long in Adelaide and also in Sydney because once they improved hygiene in those areas and controlled the rats, then plague had nowhere to go. Because think about rodents in Australia. Yes, there are a few native rodents, a handful of native rodents, in Australia, but not many. Most of them are marsupials. And plague does not seem to do very well in marsupials. It, for whatever reason, prefers rodents. And the native rodents in Australia are rare, and most of them are in the sparsely populated northern tropical regions of the country. And so the ecological situation was not good for plague in Australia, once the non-native rats were controlled because it could not spread to the native rats that occurred there. So in this case, the ecological setting in Australia was not conducive to the persistence or the survival of plague in Australia. But that was not the case everywhere. So let's go back to this map. So again, this is the spread of plague out of Hong Kong to various parts in the world. And one of the places where it spread, as you can see here, is to North America. It first made a stop in Hawaii. Um, we know that there are plague-infected ships there that then spread on, uh, uh, continued on to the continental United States. So uh, as a result of those plague ships, as we like to call them, so these are the ships carrying plague-infected rats and their fleas, docked in numerous ports in the United States, uh, from Seattle and San Francisco, Los Angeles, I mentioned Honolulu, but also uh, those are all on the west coast of the United States. But we also had plague coming into cities on our southern Gulf Coast as well. And in all cases, uh, plague transferred into the non-native rodents that lived in, in those cities, so primarily Rattus rattus and Rattus norbegicus in these cities were maintaining plague and serving as a source of plague infections for humans. But just like what happened in Australia, there was a rapid public health response focused on changing the ecology for plague, that is, controlling the rat populations in these cities, thereby shutting down um, the plague, making, making the ecological conditions unsuitable for plague to persist. And that was wildly su successful in all of these cities, with one exception. In San Francisco, it persisted long enough that it transferred over into native ground squirrels. And once that happened, around 1903 in San Francisco, and shortly after, around 1908 in Los Angeles, it then spread very rapidly uh, to different states in the western portion of the United States uh, with, within a period of 40 years. So what I'm showing here in each state then is the year that plague was first reported 
in that state and the specific location. And in every case, plague was first reported from native brown squirrels, which are rodents, of course. And so in this case, the ecological condition was quite conducive for plague in the United States. And it spread very rapidly uh, throughout the western part of the United States in the span of just 40 years. As a result, this is where we find plague in the western United States. Now, we don't have human cases. We don't have many human cases, just a handful every year. But this mostly is showing plague in uh, rodents. And you can see that it's endemic and ecologically established throughout the western United States today. Why is that? Why was it so successful in a place uh, like the United States when it wasn't in a place like Australia? Well, it comes down to the ecology, of course. Okay, this is a photo that I took near Flagstaff, and this is a place where plague is known to occur uh, in ground squirrels that occur in this high desert grassland. And you can see the ecological condition here. These, these Again, a high desert grassland interspersed with some trees here. And if we compare that with the ancient plague foci back in Central Asia, here's a photo of a high desert grassland where plague occurs in Mongolia. And you can see that just looking at them um, from an abiotic standpoint, or biotic as well, if we consider the vegetation, they look very, very similar to each other. And so the ecological conditions uh, are quite similar between Central Asia, where plague evolved, and North America, where it spread during the third pandemic. And it turns out that the rodent populations are similar as well. So this whole thing is a phylogeny of the squirrels, the squirrel family. Okay, this group over here in the middle, this is the, the marmot tribe, or the ground squirrels. And so if we take a look at what ground squirrels are important in Central Asia, again, where plague evolved, all these ones highlighted in red here are important plague hosts back in Central Asia where plague evolved, such, such as the Himalayan marmot here. Now, if we look at the North American ground squirrels that have been involved in plague, they're highlighted in blue throughout this tree. And the first one and so there were closely related rodent species to the species that plague had evolved with for thousands of years in Central Asia. There were closely related species to those uh, rodents already here in North America when plague was introduced. So the ecological conditions were uh, perfect for it to spread and also become ecologically established. And in fact, the first ground squirrel that it came into contact with in North America was this one here, the California ground squirrel, or Spermophilus beachii. And so this shows the distribution of that California ground squirrel. And remember, it first spread into ground squirrels right here near San Francisco in the early 1900s. And so efforts to eradicate and control plague in the United States early on we're focused on trying to kill as many California ground squirrels as possible. And huge campaigns were undertaken uh, with the idea of trying to eradicate and control plague. Unfortunately, before uh, that strategy could be successful, plague spread from the California ground squirrels to all the other ground squirrels that were present in the western United States. And they collectively have this geographical distribution as you can see here. And so if we overlay that distribution of all the ground squirrels, and remember these are very closely related to those ancient plague hosts back in Central Asia, if we overlay the current distribution, you can see there's a very high correlation between the distribution of these ground squirrels and then um, the current distribution of plague in the western United States. So in the case of the United States, the ecological condition was just ripe for plague to come in and become ecologically established because it was so similar to the conditions, the ecological conditions where it had evolved in Central Asia. Okay, I'll finish by talking about yet another ecological condition that arose 
um, during the third pandemic. And here I'm talking about the spread during the third pandemic to the island nation of Madagascar, which occurred about the same time around 1898, 1900, about the same time North America was first infected with plague. In Madagascar, the ecological condition is completely different for plague than it is in North America and in Central Asia. In North America and Central Asia, plague is maintained by native rodents. In Madagascar, plague is maintained by non-native rodents. So rat control has not worked very well there. The black rat, ratus ratus, occurs throughout the entire island. Uh, the Norway rat, ratus norvegicus, is found in many houses throughout the island. And the black rat and the Norway rat brought with them the oriental rat flea, uh, X. Giapis, which is one of the best plague vectors uh, known to science. But it's not sufficient. Um, there's also a native flea, the Synopsilus uh, species, that is involved in plague ecology in Madagascar. And importantly, that native flea is very uncommon at elevations below 800 meters. And so it apparently is very important to plague ecology because that restriction of this flea species to occurring above 800 meters in elevation restricts most human plague to the central highlands, which are above 800 meters. So if we look at human plague in Madagascar, that ecological restriction on that flea uh, strongly influences uh, the human plague cases. So here's a review paper written by one of our colleagues at the in Institute Pasteur Madagascar showing human plague cases across the years. And here's the summary all the way to the right. These triangles here roughly approximate the regions above 800 meters. And you can see then that most of the human plague cases occur uh, at elevations over 800 meters uh, due to the restriction of that flea to only occurring above 800 meters. And so the ecology is very important here for determining where human plague occurs in Madagascar, which has more human plague cases uh, usually than any other country in the world, hundreds, sometimes over a thousand cases uh, in a given year. And so I've shown you three different places, uh, North America, Australia, and Madagascar, and the ecological conditions were different for plague in these settings with, with uh, different implications for human disease and establishment, of course. Okay, so just to keep us all on time after our technological problems there. Let me just summarize here. Again, ecology, disease ecology, is understanding relationships between pathogens, hosts, and their environments. Uh, again, concerned with disease emergence, re-emergence, persistence and survival, and spread or dispersal. And so understanding disease ecology, of course, can aid efforts to control, prevent, and predict the emergence or re-emergence of diseases. Um, but I hope you, you've come away with this with the understanding that disease ecology can be highly complex. And, and in some cases, even with very high profile diseases such as plague, it's still poorly understood. Uh, and so improving our knowledge of disease ecology will, will definitely aid in the mapping of disease transmission risk, which um, is the focus of this whole workshop. And so that was a rough uh, kind of quick run through of disease ecology using some examples, but I would, I would be very happy to uh, answer any questions if anybody has any. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, that was a, a great introduction to start off this course. Um, because of the Google Hangout system, um, it ends up being a little bit clunky to do questions. So if you can hang around, what we're going to do is we're going to invite all of our viewers to send questions. And everybody who's tuning in, if you send your questions to this email, <laughs> 
Um, we will collect them, and if Dave can hang around, Dave and most or all of the other instructors will be back at uh, 11.30, which is in 39 minutes, for a question and answer session. Dave, do you have time? Absolutely. Great. Um, so, again, people, if you have questions, send them to this address, and we will have them for the, um, the question and answer session. For right now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a presentation from Luis Escobar, who's going to be talking to us about essentially the current toolkit in, um, in uh, spatial epidemiology and disease risk mapping. So that will begin in eight minutes. So please, everybody, uh, stick around for the questions and, before that, for Luis's presentation. Uh, what we are doing, in case there's any confusion, is we're posting each next Hangout on the Google Plus Events page. So please uh, watch the Google Event page. In just a moment, we will post the time for the next Hangout. It will begin at 11 a.m. Kansas time, which is 5 p.m. London time. Uh, so watch and come back in seven minutes, and we'll see you for Luis's presentation. And then we'll see you again in 37 minutes for question and answer. For right now, though, thank you very much, Dave, and we'll see you in just a bit.